You ready? Tēnā koe rā, Gaylene. Kia ata, waka mā au ne. Ka reo te pīrangi kei pō e ngā tangata e titirana ki ene o kāua. Ai, te tangata nei kei te tukoro mana ana ke e ki rā kei te ki ai a rangatira aia. Ka ore, kei te moe au ki te waka tauki. Ka reo te kumura i waruwaru i aia. Mā tīwi, ne. I roto tēnā ana kia aere tina waka mā, ne. Hanga ni kei te pai. Kei raro te maru o te raukura tātou. A mā te maru o te raukura rā tono o unu tanga e āwi tātou i roto o nei e nei kōrero. Koutou katoa mā takitaki mai tēnā koutou nei o tātou tamana ki mokopuna. Kei konei rā. Gaylene, as I've just said, I'd hate people to think that in any way I felt sort of proud or as someone rather some sort of VIP because people who know me will know that I'd rather not speak if people thought that. But however, I've uh, been convinced that maybe there's the odd thing I might be able to relate, maybe of some help to the upbringing I had in Pariaka and its history, mainly for posterity, I guess, for the sake of our mokopuna. So I thought I'd begin where it all began. Now, Maru Kira, a kaumatua, asked me when I was in my mid-forties. Rihari, my Māori name, do you really know what happened when your kuru and kui came to get you? I said, not intimately. All I know is they came. He said, well, before I go, I want to tell you, because I was there. I said, thank you, he kuru. He said, there was a big house just down from the post office in Pungarehu that I recall we used to take our mātauto come on the horse and cart from the beach and share what we'd got. And we used to share it with the people there. I never knew why, because I was too young. He said, she came in, and your mother and father, as you know, were having problems in their relationship. And she said in Māori, there's nothing more precious, a tonga, than a mokopuna. Clearly, you don't have the time to give them the care he not only deserves that he needs, therefore, in our tikanga, we take him. No choice. Took me away. And I reckon I've received three great blessings in life. That was the first one, because I learned practically everything about Pariaka from my koro and kui. Tāna was the adopted son of Tarewaitara. Tarewaitara, of course, with Tewiti's right arm, and Tahanga was reared on the knees of those two people. I learnt the tradition of the Rokura. My kui, whose first language was Māori, so after being warned at school, primary school, don't you dare speak Māori, but we'll deal with you, I'd come home after speaking English all day, be total Māori immersion. Little did I know this was to be the dynamic that would give the language to Kōhāreo, immersion. So right up until I was 12 and just before my 13th birthday, when the second blessing arrived and I was picked up off the road by a great mighty missioner, Father Eden. And who, who was that? Pāriatana, Father Eden. He was famous in Māori. And I was leading a gang of delinquents. He stopped us at Pariaka Road corner said, how would you like to go to school? I said, where? He said, well, you can either go to Auckland, Wellington, or down the South Island. I said, how do you get to the South Island? He said, on a boat. I said, God, I'm going overseas. Because all the travel pictures of Fitzpatrick were going around there at the Pungaree Hall, I used to see them. So they took me back home. My quarter was pleased to get rid of me because I was in trouble with welfare very badly. They were thinking of making me a state child because of all the problems with the kids I was leading around Pariaka. And my kui, uh, she was pretty sad about the fact that I was going away, but she did say to me, Kia mo i o koe, o wai wai kia piri rā ki ngā onu onu hene, o te unua, ka ue koe o ki mai waka i. Never forget, your feet belong to the humble soil of Pariaka, 
Don't ever come back here and think you're somebody because of the knowledge you might get from the Pākehā world. Because you're not. So, why I went. Life as a child for me, I really was a marae mokopuna. Uh, I'm reminded of the painting that Muru, Savon Muru's got at Tanio, with the old lady and the mokopuna following behind. I really was reared Anangā Panakuti, the petticoat of my kui. I hung on to her and she took me everywhere. Tangis, Ngā Rā Tapu, 18th, 19th, Tapaua, Rauruki, when they collected the money, when they went out weeding mangles down to Kāpunga, would take us all day by horse and cart. We'd go there with our swag like gypsies, just to make a living. Weed all the weeds for Abbott, the farmer. Come back, pick blackberries in the season, and do what was called pi'o. And they would go around and trade their blackberries with the rich farmer's wives and get the, you know, their clothes, their throwdowns, come back, and then they'd be on the catwalk at Pariaka while they tried all the stuff to see which one fitted. Now, my queen had a real problem because she was close to 20 stone. So somehow or other, Parker's had a different diet. So she had great difficulty getting the right size for her. But they were the sort of things that they did humbly, just to eke a living, just to survive. Every family there grew crops. Each year we would go down to the beach down Bally Road to the reserve that's called Wainui. And in the planting season we would plant kumara, kamokomo, watermelon, uh, particularly, particularly kumara. And then when it was time to harvest, we'd stay there for a couple of months, do the planting, go back, later during the harvesting season, harvest it, bring it all back to Pariaka, preserve it and the ruas and the hole in the ground with fern to keep it dry. And we would sort out the best kumara and the best potatoes and the ngata was the small ones, which we took home. The best was always preserved for Manueri, for the meeting houses, to Manaki and look after people. And that cycle would happen every year, every year. And it would take us, oh, the best part of a couple of hours to drive in a horse and cart from Padiaga with all our pack, take our food. And generally, we left some pots in the old batches down at the beach. We'd stay there and go to school from there. No shoes, walk along the road. There's no problem there. Now I can't even walk around the house without shoes. My feet are so tender. And we used to kick stones, actually. Yeah. And uh, so it was very much assistance of subsistence. My kura grew everything. Corn, kamo kamo, pumpkin, strawberries, orchards, everything. The only thing we bought, the flour mill was no longer in access. Things like flour and sugar, uh, most of it, we kept ourselves, and of course, they had their traditional ways of preserving the food. Like meaty tatru tatru, where you sort of grill meat, yeah. small pieces, and you put it in dripping and you leave it there and it keep for four or five months, pull it out, mix it with puha, quarter two they call it water, it's beautiful. And they'd have the outside safes like everybody had in those days, with the cool air to keep it nice and we'd have the corn that was always put in the river that's fermented and comes back uh, kangawai, uh, which I haven't quite got used to actually because the smell's quite strong, oh. <laughs> fermented corn. Uh, I also saw, I thought everybody buried their dead without coffins. Never had coffins. I'd never seen a coffin until I was an adult. And, you know, they were buried in mats. What I didn't know, they had cover cover leaves, how they used to preserve the bodies. I never saw any of that side. I only learned till later. And, of course, we have the classic case of Therese Tangi, back to the traditional way of treating 
So, you know, it's quite an order to go through that process rather than the normal. So I saw then how it's important when you take power, my kui who couldn't go across the rocks because of a huge weight would scream at me from the shore. Watch that colour stone, that one. And if ever I walked away without turning the stone back, she would scream at me from the shore. I was to learn later on. I used to think, what a hassle. I didn't know till later, of course, it was conservation, because yeah. the power was moving. I learned what Ngā Tau o Mā Kirikiri are, the neat tides. When the tide goes out the furthest and you get the different coloured stones, where you get the shellfish that aren't so handy, that's the only time of the year they're there. And when you know the colours, you know where to go. All those things I didn't realise later on, just how significant they were. And then on a tour with Kuromuhi, as we went from New Plymouth to Parihaka, he told me where all the Rua Kais were. The different rivers as we go through, get by the warrior school, he said, you see that stone? Always a tuna there. Whenever there's a hui at Pariaka, you go back. You only take what's needed for the marae, a naval rebirth. And you go down to Bailey Road, Wanganui, there's one place where all the crayfish are. And then he knew also what were the medicinal plants, all the medicinal plants you needed. The sad thing, of course, is most of the bush is gone now. Um, probably the thing that had the greatest influence on me is how there was this huge shearing of everything. As soon as someone got sick, the whole power would rally. They'd rally around to make sure they were all right, they're cared for, the kids are cared for and so forth. Uh, my kui, for example, was the midwife. She delivered all the babies. And then she told me, and I had to really, really, like getting blood out of a stain, why did she stop? And I've actually spoken uh, to the baby that was involved, he's now what? He'd be at least in his 50s. I saw him at not the last Pariaka Festival, the one before, and he called out to me to come across and meet his kids whom I'd never met and who I believe virtually hadn't been to Pariaka, were only there because of the Peace Festival, which is one of the great positives I see. Young people who know they have some sort of lineage but now here's an opportunity where they come back and feel their roots and feel their soul and their heart. And I went over and while he was talking, I said, oh, I want to tell you something. Your mother was Rungo Dick. Her best friend was my kui, Ari, Ada. She told me the most difficult delivery was a caesarean trying to deliver you. And she told me also, rather embarrassingly, that she felt she lost her nerve and never did it again because there was her best friend struggling for life while she performed the caesarean. And he was a product. Boy, what a fine boy he is. Yeah. Rana, terrific guy. He said, well, I never knew that. Matua, I said, yeah. And of course, the other great story for Pariaka at Kuramogi told me there was an old man part of the Kaumarua. The Kaumarua were those who were sent by King Itafio. And King Itafio said to the Kaumarua, I did talk to Kaumarua, King Aipara, Kerawa, and Maui. That's what he said, word for word. Go and serve the two shepherds. And that was Tuati and Tōru. So they were sent to serve. Owa Oka was of this line. And very late in life, probably my recollection of him when I was a boy, probably about 12, he probably then was probably close to 80, I would have thought. I'm only guessing. He went on a rare visit to Ngarawahia, and lo and behold, he died. Went really reluctantly. So several buses gathered at Tikwiti, Kuramori told me, and 
they had a tradition where they would select a speaker for Taranaki. And there was a unanimous voice, Mu'i, ko koe te reo mo Taranaki o te maunga o tu mai rā. You're our speaker, but your mission is this. We're going there to let Waikato know in no uncertain manner that we're going to take him and bring him back to where he'd lived all his life. So he told me, they went up there and Waikato stood to speak Waikato. And he said he was just getting ready to get up and do the tunnel. And Tapuya was sitting on the ground, she said, Taku Tamaiti, Waio. Leave him here, there's a tohu. He was part of the Komaru. There must be a reason why he's brought back to where they originated from originally, that tradition. Leave him here. And he got up and he told me this is what he said. Taku Ain, my mother, my superior. Kareu Aire Mai, Takaya Tupapaku. I have not come to steal a body. Angari te aria mai rā, te pare kawa kawa me te aro a te rūkara o te rā maunga te tōia tu mai rā. But to bring the love of the rūkara, the aroha and the pare kawa kawa, to pay our respects to him. And he said, the whole of Taranaki, I thought, what a traitor. I'm going, did you hear what he said? Now standing alongside him was the eminent kaumatu late in life, I think he might have been a brother, Tonganui. I think he was his brother, he was certainly the same line. And he told me Tonganui was going to hit him, punch him down on the marae. And Kuriki, King Kuriki, then king at that time, said that the first woman of royal blood of the Kingitanga that gives birth that will be the offering of Waikato to Taranaki when that child is born. The first one born, do you know Marua, Tara? Was Marua. They sent the word to Koromoi and they went up and they gave him the baby and they called him Tako Marua, that's his full name, which means the 12th, one of the 12th, to link again the tie was Waikato, so the boy was the link. That's why he was brought back and was reared by them. Now I told him, well, he was a grown man, and I was staggered that he didn't know that story from his own kuru. I actually told him. I have a feeling his kuru told me so. When he got old at the right time, he'd be able to tell him. So he's really, I believe, he's really a destiny, and he's an outstanding boy, outstanding boy, humble, great insight, wonderful in mental health. He was wonderful in the crisis team here. See, I think that there are some wonderful young people. Mm. Absolutely. But I think that's a beautiful story. It is. Because in it, when Koro told me there are a whole lot of lessons. You, know, you might think because he spent all his life here, they should have just grabbed him. But you see, you've got to think of the Rokura. They don't operate like that. The bus, Auntie Ian and them told me, they were furious with him. They felt he was a traitor, he let them down. They were to learn in later years. It's all meant to be, and it actually is, a very strong link with Waikato, apart from Ngā Kiwai o Te Kete. Huirangi might have spoke about that. Urua Ngā Kiwai o Te Kete, the great bonded saying with Waikato. There are two handles to the kit. Tau ki taranaki, tau ki Waikato, or vice versa, tau ki Waikato. Just the kiwai, and that's tied up with another history that we haven't got time to go into. They are the things I heard as I was growing up. And Tommy Mau Tonga's sister, Josephine, says she was at a meeting when I was a young, very young boy when she heard the old people say that they had hoped that I might be one that may carry some of the heritage of Pariaka. Now, I don't have any recognition of that. I was about 10. Uh, Josephine Hu, he tells me she was there. 
and I heard them say, that's why they nurtured you. If I was asked, I don't believe I'm a linguist like Ruke, Ruke and Huirangi, a brilliant linguist, wonderful, talented. I don't believe I'm at their level. But the one thing I'm very strong in is tikanga protocol. From the time I was 12, I was nurtured right through on what is the right thing to do and why, and why we do certain things. I feel very strong about that. And I'm finding that there's a huge, huge renaissance at the moment amongst 30 year olds, especially the women, who are leading the Wananga at Pariaka right now, who are leading Karanga, who are leading Waiata, Shirlene and company. I'm under huge pressure from this age group to take Wananga at Pariaka. Huge pressure. In fact, I'm almost beginning to cringe every time I go there. Two or three of them are going to bail me up. <laughs> and I think. Well, there's one way to stop. Well, I've. I have said publicly, I think we've been very poor in the process of succession. And really teaching our kids, we've been very poor at that. There has been a psyche that keep it to yourself because they might commercialise it, they might print it in books, they might sell it. I used to hear the old people saying that. No, no, don't tell the parkie anything. I'll cash in on it. But you see, it was all right when they had about another 120 people who was carrying all this from each generation. We're getting down to about three. In places, we got nobody, actually. So it's something that we really have to take a serious look at. And I have a dream of a Wadekwana of Taranaki of their own. I think it's wonderful. There's dozens and dozens of our wonderful young people going to Raukawa. I think that's a real irony. When we have people of the resources of Ruakiri, Hemi, Huirangi at our back door. You know, I think the time for reckoning has come. I really do. Things can happen. They cannot happen for a long, long time, and then they can yes. happen. Yes. Which is like you know the peace festival. Mm. And so. Um, See, there's a great resource. Yeah. Tabinina has huge knowledge. He's done huge research. He was nurtured by a wonderful, wonderful. Well, he's really a Tonga from. Uh, he was from Pariaka as a young man, uh, Rangi Mutu'ia, up the Wanganui River. You know, he's had wonderful tuition from them. A great little story about Rangi, to Rangi Mutu'ia. One of the original trustees at Pariaka for Tourist people was uh, Tai Rawiti, Tatai. And apparently, unbeknown to the people, he looked after all the cause. If people were in real need, without authority and nobody knew, he would help them out, which is almost sacrilege with the money. Now, I never found this out till years later. Now, apparently, when Rangi Mutuhia went away to Wanganui, he was short of his fear to get there on the train or the bus or whatever it was. So the old fella gave him some, a little bit of a help. But years later, I don't know specifically what age, but close to his 70s, he came back to pay his debt <laughs> at Pariaka. This is how people found out what the Thai had been doing. It was news to them. He actually borrowed money and he came back to pay his debt because it was haunting his conscience. And that was Rangimuti, one of Milton's tutors. Kōnui Pia. Marvellous man from what I know. The best example I've heard of how you should look after people was the great matriarch Moirewarewa, who had such an influence on Huirangi. Tamiringa and I were sitting in Rangi Kapuya. This would be close to 50, 40 years ago. And she said to me, do you know how you're related to the Ohio's? I said, well, only partly. 
you know, how you related to that boy. So we had that discussion. And then she took me aside and she said, do you know what waka ma'aki means? I said, no, I don't. She said, well, I'll tell you. Because I want you to do everything you can to protect the unique things about Pariaka. One of them was Maaki. I said, yeah, what's that, huh? Kui? She said, it goes like this. When the thousands used to come to Pariaka to hui, they never had enough women to go to each table and look after them and host them and make them feel at home. So they have six, eighteen sittings. And each time the same woman went and pretended they were eating. Get the pie queen, all right, are you comfortable? The bell would go again and they'd go again. And do that time after time after time. She said, that is what Marky means, and I've never forgotten that. Manuhiri never knew it was the same woman, of course, because they already had their cake. And I've thought about those sorts of things, because that's the heritage I'd love us to leave our book on. I really would. I think that's more important. How to really have respect the dignity of other human beings, which they had in abundance. As they went out to weed the mangles, grub gorse, Every March they'd come back and part of the money that they got from the palmers they had put as a kuha and rangi kapuya to help keep the marae going and each family would contribute whatever they could. I also learnt about...